Thanks. Well, it's a complete thrill to be uh, back at Chicago. Do we have the slides up? Uh, can you see slides? We have a technological uh, whiz here. <laughs> there you go. So uh, it's an amazing institution. This is a unique institution. And uh, I'd be here longer, except my daughter's getting married tomorrow. Not my two-year-old daughter, my 24-year-old daughter. Um, uh, so I have two uh, tales for you about politics these days. The uh, two most memorable interactions I had with uh, people in the Republican Party while I was in uh, Washington. The first was with the recently reelected Senator Roberts, who put a hold on my confirmation, which means we couldn't have a vote because he was holding me. And after a while, I uh, got to meet him. That's what you do if someone is, has a hold on you. It's kind of like romance, except the opposite. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know what we need in the job of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs? We need someone who spent a lot of time about univers at University of Chicago, who actually studied regulation, who favors cost-benefit analysis. That's exactly what we need. And I said, well, I have a brother like that. And he said, I'm completely for you. Uh, you're going to be great. And he says, of course, I'm going to vote against you. Uh, my second tale is, is, a, is a little edgier, at least my own experience was. It involved uh, Chairman Issa. When the House of Representatives switched to the Republican Party in 2011, uh, there was multiple concern on the part of people in the Obama administration about what life was going to be like. And uh, I got a request from Chairman Issa early uh, for all my emails including my emails to Jeff, which are kind of personal. <laughs> no, he didn't ask for those, but all my government emails. And it, it looked like it could be uh, a challenging relationship. And he called me to testify on regulation, which was fine and within his rights completely, and it was a gentlemanly request. And I decided to emphasize the uh, regulatory look back, as we call it, which is an effort to reduce regulatory burdens a very serious effort and a significant part of my job. And I wrote testimony to that effect. It had all the appropriate clearances. And then we got a note the day before the testimony in which Chairman Issa said uh, this was not responsive to his request. Uh, he did not want us to focus on the regulatory look back. He wanted us to focus on regulation in general. And he was, I don't think he used the word outrage, but he was very disappointed. And it was a little more red in color than the word disappointment connotes uh, with what he saw, uh, not unreasonably as uh, unresponsiveness on our part. So what I decided to do was to stay up very late that night and to do new testimony that would be completely responsive to his request and got the appropriate clearances. And uh, as soon as I showed up at the hearing room, I said to him, and Mr. Chairman, I'm very sorry you found that original draft not responsive. We have a new version, which I think you'll find more consistent with what you were looking for. And uh, the, the response the chairman had was uh, surprising to me. He was, uh, uh, it was clear that he felt that he had been treated with deference and respect, and that that made all the difference. And the, the quieting, at least of my, in my own experience, of conflict uh, was, I think, partly a reflection of a sense that someone in the executive branch had shown deference and respect to someone of the opposing party. Okay, uh, I have a, a one idea for you. I have a, about 25 slides, but I have one idea for you, which is that in an era in which partyism, which I'm going to define, is rampant, uh, the long-standing concern about open-ended grants of authority to the executive branch has things exactly backwards. That is to say, whether the president is a Democrat or a Republican, the uh, institutional fix for partyism, as we're now experiencing it, consists not in uh, you know, blanket grants of authority to the executive branch, but in somewhat more respect for presidential discretion, let's call it, than uh, would otherwise be the case. So the suggestion is if we have a President uh, Paul in 2017 or a President Clinton in 2017, 
our institutional orientation should be receptive to the exercise of discretion in the face of ambiguous laws. And that that is especially important in an era of what I'm going to call partyism. Now this idea, as I'm describing it, it actually has a technocratic rather than a political underpinning. So insofar as there's a kind of fighting faith behind these words, is that many of our deepest arguments about questions of values are actually tacitly arguments about facts. And once we make progress on questions of fact, the value disagreements are often greatly narrowed. And the executive branch, at least under reasonable assumptions, which I think have cut across at most administrations most of the time, is um, making judgments in a way that's closely attuned to facts. That's not always the case. On hot button issues, you might see a degree of politicization. But the claim is that disputes are resolved in the executive branch much more often than not on the basis of uh, empirical matters rather than high-flown value judgments. And there's a link between that claim about kind of the secret history of dispute, which is there are actually disputes about facts and the institutional recommendation, which is increased receptivity toward executive discretion. Okay, uh, politics now. That's not a surprising slide, but you needed a picture. Uh, Nonpartyism. There's a judge whose political affiliation is not clear from particular opinions and which reflects, I think, part of the culture at this institution, which is one where the force of the argument rather than the, its source and where the political affiliation of the person making the argument is an irrelevancy. Even to point to that would be kind of a taboo here. Yes? Okay, the thesis is that partyism, which I'm about to define, exists and has been growing. The idea is mere identification with a political party <coughs> produces hostility to the opposing party and a willingness to believe that its members have a host of bad characteristics. That leads to a terrible fact, which is reactive devaluation, a word used in some social science literature in a different connection, where the idea is that because an idea is suggested by someone who has donkeys or elephants in the background, the idea is devalued. Uh, in many ways, partyism, I'm going to suggest, is worse than racism, and that's an empirical claim. It has serious consequences for both politics and daily life. Now I have to bracket the normative point to notice that along one dimension racism is far more invidious. That is racism is a matter of seizing on what is clearly a morally irrelevant characteristic and a, a, a set of political views doesn't have that particular feature. If we had a, you know, a, a, an aggressive and hateful communist party in the United States, we wouldn't want to, f to identify something called communismism and say that that was a bad thing because opposition to communism would be justified. It would be a legitimate political rejection of the creed. And so communismism would be a matter, if you're with me, of just making the waters murky. I want to suggest that partyism doesn't have that shape because the size and diversity of both the Republican and Democratic parties today, notwithstanding their identifiable bases, is such that to treat them as a, uh, as a uh, leper, that's, uh, that's damaging and unjustified. Okay, 1960s and 1970s, there's another picture for you. Here's uh, some evidence. The number of enacted laws, this is a crude measure, uh, is the lowest in recent years since 1973. Less than a third of Truman's do nothing Congress. If you look at the average from 1995 to 2010, it's about 50% higher than the number in 2011, 2012, and 2013, 2014. The Senate had only 99 votes, the lowest since 1991 the House the fewest hours since 2005. The accomplishments of the 113th Congress consist largely of funding the government <laughs> and in terms of issues that have been left addressed, they include Syria, tax reform, the child migrant crisis, immigration reform, and decaying infrastructure. There was a change in student loan interest rates. We don't want to trivialize that, but 
not the greatest issue facing America today. Okay, here's a reflection of partyism. The proportion of parents who would dis be displeased, upset, or unhappy if children married members of the opposite party. In 1960, the number was very close to zero. In 2008, it jumped to 21% and higher. In 2010, it's in part of Republicans, nearly 50%, and Democrats are about a third. These numbers, by the way, are very much higher than across other demographic grounds on which you would expect to see a degree of prejudice. Uh, some of you probably know the implicit association test. Some of you, I hope, have taken the implicit association test. It's a fascinating measure of people's intuitive judgments about classes of people. The way you take the test is you see on the picture of a screen, let's say, an African American on the left and a white on the right. You see the word good and bad on the left and the right. White people have an easy time associating a word at the bottom, like delightful, with the left, when the left has a white person and the word good. If the one on the left has an African American and the word has good, they will have a harder time, white people will, associating the word delightful with that. That's a signal of an implicit association, uh, implicit associations in the head that are racially coded. The implicit association test uh, is a good way of getting a quick entree into people's intuitive associations. A positive score on the test shows positive feelings toward Democrats, negative one toward Republicans. Okay, you can see, I hope, from this slide that along racial lines, the implicit associations are showing prejudice, but the party prejudice is significantly higher. That, I think, is a remarkable finding of the in its intuitive character now. So a Republican who sees a de the word Democrat and good will have a hard time clicking an association with the word delightful. But if the word is Republican and good and delightful, then the association is automatic and easy and speedy. The fact that party prejudice, as measured by an unconscious measure that basically picks up on the speed of association, is significantly greater along party lines than racial lines, that's a stunning finding, I believe. Okay, there are these tests called thermometer tests where the question is, what is your mean re rating of your own party and opposing parties? The top of this graph shows that Democrats and Republicans are rating their own party pretty consistently, favorability rating of 70 to 80% from 1975 to th 2010. But the favorability rating of the opposing party has declined rapidly and at an accelerating rate since roughly 1985. That suggests that people who are Republicans increasingly think of Democrats as bad and vice versa. In fact, Democrats think that Republicans are worse than big business and Republicans think that Democrats are worse than people on welfare by the thermometer test. The cleavage is greater than the cleavage along lines of race and religion. There's a game called the trust game where you get some money, you can give it to a stranger if the stranger gets money from you, it's tripled by the experimenter. And then the question is, will, you, the, will the, the stranger give some of the tripled money back to the original donor? It's a trust game because if you think you can trust the other person, you have some money to gain by giving some over. Otherwise, you can just keep it if you distrust the person. So it's a nice little measure of trust. If people see that the stranger is a Republican, and they are themselves Republican, then there's a significant increase in the level of trust. But that's not the interesting finding. The interesting finding is if they know the person is a Democrat, they will show reduced trust. Now this is a very puzzling finding, I think, because the idea if you're a Republican that Democrats are less trustworthy in the trust game when they don't know your party affiliation, that's confusing. And so too for Democrats. Okay, these are kind of experimental studies testing behavior. Tests of scholarship applicants show that if you are a Republican and you're deciding whether to give a scholarship to a student, if you see that the student was head of the Republican Party, 
in high school, you are going to give that person a boost. And in fact, you'll give them negative points if they are a Democrat. Members of both parties choose the in-party candidate 80% of the time. And that's significantly larger than the racial bias, which is actually modestly pro-African American for both whites and African Americans. Okay, what I think is remarkable here is there's a kind of uh, <coughs> pleasing finding with respect to race, which is while similarly situated candidates, the, the, the nationally representative sample will give a very slight um, boost to the African American candidate, if the merit is clearly one way or the other, Americans go with the person who has the better merit, whatever their skin color is. Merit prevails in a racial context. Not so with party. Democrats will choose a Democratic college applicant who is clearly worse than their similarly situated Republican. And Republicans are exactly the same. For college admissions, scholarship, and prioritization of dialysis, party really matters in terms of what people want to do. OK, how far will partisans go? 65% of people in a large sample will share a critical name-calling article if it attacks the opposing party, but only 25% if it attacks one's own party. People who are composing a team to complete something as trivial as a crossword type puzzle will choose a less qualified independent over an opposing partisan. Okay, in terms of finding protesters, investigating potentially corrupt political donors, and compensating people for a murdered government staffer, if there's a disjunction between the decider, so to speak, and the political party member, we will see a bias, a negative bias. Okay, that's my data set. Uh, why is there partyism? And here are some speculations. First natural thing to say is that ideological differences between Republicans and Democrats have grown over the last decades, and that's kind of completely mapping on to the political disparities we observe. It's a reasonable speculation, but the data doesn't support it. That is, you can't correlate the extent of ideological disagreement with the opposing party with the extent of opposition along the various dimensions I've described. So people who are intensely in disagreement with members of the opposing party are often not showing prejudice of the kind just described. And people who are only modestly misaligned with the opposing political party will often show very intense prejudice along the line we've described. So ideolo ideology, so far as we can tell so far, is not responsible for this disagreement. Political campaigns do seem to be responsible in the sense that the negativity along party lines grows when we're in the midst of a campaign. So the intensity of political advertising does seem to have a causal uh, contribution here. Segmentation of media markets is plausibly a contributor, though we don't have great d data. And location, where people are increasingly sorting themselves along political lines so they're living together if they share political convictions, that seems also to be a contributor. OK, this may be the most important slide of my 20 odd, though there are no pictures. The question is, what are the consequences for democratic life? And I'll uh, take them in uh, no particular order. We did a study, I and Reed Hastie at, uh, at the business school here a few years ago, on group polarization, which is uh, a phenomenon by which like-minded people end up in a more extreme point in line with their pre-deliberation tendencies. And what we found is if you take people in Boulder, Colorado, put them together in groups of six and ask them to talk about climate change, affirmative action, and same-sex unions, they will become more unified and more left-wing on all issues as a result of a short period of discussion with one another. That is, if you select people in Boulder, put them in a room, ask them to debate to a verdict, and ask them both to state their views anonymously pre-deliberation and anonymously post-deliberation, there will be a shift in their anonymous post-deliberation statements of view 
toward greater extremism on all three issues and unanimity on all three issues. We did exactly the same thing in Colorado Springs, which is a conservative place. And what we found is just as the Boulder people shifted dramatically to the left, the Colorado Springs shift people shifted dramatically to the right in a way that squelched on the part of both sets of people the internal diversity that pre-existed their internal deliberations. That is to say where the Boulder people were basically here and the Colorado Springs people were here on the ideological spectrum, after the like-minded people talked to one another, they were spread like this. And internal diversity on the part of both groups were <coughs> squelched. I think we're seeing that every day in the United States, including in legislative forums as well as citizen groups. Okay, second point, uh, party over policy. There are findings that if you ask Republicans or Democrats their views on certain issues, you will get a set of results that sometimes have a degree of unpredictability. But if similarly situated people are asked those views and told what party leaders think, they go in lockstep. Which is to say that people's antecedent or independent political convictions are often overwhelmed by the signal that's given by the stated views of political leadership. So much so that Republicans who would be nervous about certain kinds of welfare reform that seems arguably spending a lot and helping poor people too much or in a way that maybe creates bad incentives will be in favor of those policies once they hear that Republican leadership is for those policies. Now that finding party over policy among citizenry, I think that is itself of interest. But here's the kind of knife accompanying the empirical study. If you ask people whether they were influenced by the views of the party leadership, they overwhelmingly say, no, not at all. This is my view. So if you get the study, you take a bunch of people, Republican or Democrat, ask them a view, that that's the control. Then you have another group of people, you ask them their view after they're told what the party thinks. The second party view is in lockstep with the party. Then you ask them, did they, were they influenced by what the party think? They say sincerely, no. So there's blindness to the domination of party view over policy judgment. Okay, there's an effort by a lot of well-meaning people with no political affiliation apparent to try to correct error on the part of both the left and the right. The uh, alarming finding is that if errors are corrected, people of the opposing party often believe still what they believed before, and the only difference is they believe it strongly, more strongly than they did before, than before they heard the correction. So Republicans, and it is completely symmetrical for Democrats, when informed in the relevant period that Iraq did not, in fact, have weapons of mass destruction, ended up thinking more strongly, even though the source was evidently credible, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. This is very destructive to democratic debate because it suggests on factual matters it's gonna be hard for politically uh, invested people to be informed by credible sources because either it gets their back up and get, increases their motivation to believe the previous thing or because it's kind of a cognitive signal. Why would they deny it if it weren't true? And that makes debate really hard. There's some old studies finding biased assimilation. If you're watching a football game, let's say, between Ohio State and Michigan, you're an Ohio State fan, uh, you tend to think that Ohio State is being mistreated by the referees and Michigan similarly. With respect to political issues, suppose you think that campaign finance law needs to be changed and Citizens United is wrong and the Supreme Court needs to revise it. And then you read a bunch of balanced presentations with some people arguing the affirmative and some people the arguing the negative. What's going to happen to your view? you might think that you'd become more moderate because you're hearing the view that it's okay right now. Not so. People who read balanced presentations feel more extreme versions of what they thought before. And if you think Citizens United was great 
and that the effort to reform camp finance is a bad idea, you read both views, then you become more committed to your previous belief. It's a cousin of the backfiring correction idea, but it's different. It's about biased assimilation of neutral information sources so that people end up uh, more polarized as a result of balanced presentations. Okay, the result of all this is that people end up in parallel political world, worlds. Okay, is this a governance problem? It might be a problem for democratic debate. Is it actually a governance problem? Well, certainly the, ch the, the chart you saw before attests to the presence of gridlock, low levels of legislation. On certain assumptions, that's okay if the existing statutory system is fine and it's not broken. But on reasonable assumptions, there are a lot of problems out there that need to be fixed. Hearings and investigations in an era of partyism are not infrequently for the cameras. They're extremely disruptive to efforts to get things done, often, and that creates a challenge for governance. Exec executive action remains possible and important, but there's limits on how much can be achieved. We're likely to see some extremist lurching in an era of partyism with checks or unprincipled compromises if we get anything. Okay, there are a number of people who take car charts of the sort I started out with showing low levels of legislative activity and kind of declare victory for the diagnosis that there's a problem. That would be uh, premature, wouldn't it? It might be that low levels of activity are fine given the fact that higher levels would compromise well-being. So what we want to focus on, I think, in thinking about whether partyism is a problem and how to fix it, is on what are the actual social consequences of the situation in which we find ourselves. What are its effects on real people? Okay. Uh, here are four solutions. Uh, the first is to exploit timing. And here the idea is, after a presidential election, there is a genuine glow which means the transition period is immensely important and under favorable conditions, it's too hard to know whether we're in those conditions. It's possible to do something immediately after the midterms as well. So solution number one, which I got to have a close up look at and I wouldn't have anticipated before, is that in transition, whether it's a Republican or Democrat, there's a flurry of activity over a period of few months in which it's possible to assemble a framework for getting things done, which has a chance of commanding bipartisan support. This is true in state offices as well as at the national level. And the idea would be, if we're going to see solutions to the unaddressed problems in the earlier chart, the uh, president-elect ought to be fixated, fixed like a laser on the short period in which it's possible to do things. Second solution is to find overlaps. And here the idea is there are some things on which people aren't confounded by party affiliation. Three that are getting attention today are free trade, tax reform, and regulatory reform. The idea of a regulatory look back, which uh, Congressman Issa actually liked, even though he didn't want my testimony all to be about that, is something that promises to command bipartisan support. It's an avenue. Of course, the challenge is that as each of these three becomes particularized, the difficulty posed by party affiliation increases, which is to say, just as in law, we often have incompletely theorized agreement on a particular, a minimalist ruling from the court, or an incompletely theorized agreement on a generalization, as in the Constitution itself, once legislation is drawn up that can't be so particularistic as to be a resolution of just a case and can't be so abstract as to be a principle, things can get extremely challenging. Okay, here's my favorite, which is why it has two stars next to it, which is to suggest that the legal culture has things exactly backwards in its skepticism about delegation of discretion exactly backwards in circumstances of partyism. There's an old paper by an administrative law guy named Jerry Mishaw called Why Administrators Should Make Political Decisions. Much of his emphasis is on the accountability of the president. 
I want to emphasize something else, which is the technocratic foundations of many policy judgments. If the question is whether particulate matter should be regulated more aggressively than it now is, that's a hugely important policy issue. Particulate matter is the most important environmental pollutant. If you look at the benefits of regulations over the last decades, a very significant chunk, somewhere between 40 and 55 percent, of the total benefits of regulations over the last years come from one thing, that is EPA efforts to reduce exposure to particulate matter. That is a dominant driver of benefits from federal regulation. You can't figure out what to do about particulate matter by thinking whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. You have to engage very closely, don't you, with the science? That's a technical question. The government recently required cameras in cars so that people don't back over and kill children or disabled people. It's very hard to figure out whether cameras in cars are a good idea without knowing concretely how much they're going to do for people who are in bark of cars. Are they going to save one life or 100 or 200? And what are they going to do for the automobile market? Is this going to be a, you know, a deterrent to buying cars, which would kind of defeat the point? OK. Uh, if you look at the authorization for the use of military force, something a lot of the Bush opponent, a lot of Bush's opponents were skeptical of, there's a good argument that the Bush administration had it quite right in asking for a relatively broad authorization on the theory that the threats to the United States that Al-Qaeda is associated with are multiple, the difficulty of getting specific congressional authorization on one thing or another is really serious. And in a context where the nation is focused on the threats, to get a broad grant of authority is helpful so that partyism doesn't end up confounding future presidents. The idea here would be one that would be receptive to something that has made a mixed reception in the international law community, which is the Obama administration's argument that ISIL, having formerly been part of Al-Qaeda, remains legally permissibly characterized as Al-Qaeda, which it was part of until this year such that the president has the authority under the old authorization for the use of military force to go after them. And kind of the background idea here is that receptivity toward the president's interpretive authority for the authorization for the use of military force doesn't have the same party valence, but has the same institutional foundation as receptivity toward the president's authority to interpret the Clean Air Act to reach greenhouse gases. So what I'm saying here is a controversial claim. It's that just as we should understand as lawyers, the president, particularly in an era of partyism, to have room to understand delegations as broadly as their language can bear in the domestic context, the same should be true in the international context. Otherwise, things get caught up in charts of the sort that um, suggest people don't want their sons and daughters to marry someone of the opposing political party. It just occurs to me, my daughter's getting married tomorrow and I have no idea what political affiliation. Uh, is that, I, one of you please call and find out. We might have to, will we call the wedding off? No, okay. Uh, solution number four, uh, pre-commitment. Here the idea is that it's possible to have a form of anti-partyism by design through pre-commitment strategies and default rules that make its effects less uh, damaging. So the question here, and this is a very incipient slide, is we need to figure out what happens when Congress does nothing. And sometimes that can be less harmful if some antecedent legislation alters the default. So you all know, don't you, about the base closing legislation where there's a commission that makes certain recommendations, they kick in unless uh, Congress does something organized about them. The beauty of the base closing legislation is that it reduces the effects of one form of partyism, that is local efforts to protect bases, through a kind of pre-commitment strategy. I don't think many people, well I should phrase it a little more carefully, I think a lot of people aren't very excited about the sequester which has invited in automatic, rigid cuts in federal programs. 
I'm not personally very excited about the sequester, but it did have one institutional consequence which I think was not anticipated, which is power through automaticity. The goal of the sequester was to force Congress to make some hard choices by saying we're going to have such automatic, rigid, unthought through cuts. They're going to go into effect, and since everyone's going to hate that, Congress is going to make the hard decisions. Now what was not anticipated, I was there, and I confess I certainly didn't anticipate it, was that partyism would be so severe that the draconian rigid cuts, which were supposed to be a forcing mechanism, would actually come into play. Now that is not a wonderful story in terms of substance, but institutionally it's really interesting. It suggests that a pre-commitment strategy of the sort the sequester actually is can be far more effective than anticipated. The question is what kind of other sequester type or commission type structures can be created that alter the default? They create a form of automaticity. Okay, is it possible to target anti-partyism as such to suggest that it is, it is itself vulnerable to some sort of cultural slash political switch? I'll tell you uh, a joke and then a story. You don't have to laugh at the joke. There used to be light bulb jokes. You know, how many University of Chicago, I'm gonna make one up. How many University of Chicago law professors does it take to screw in a light bulb? One, because that's the most efficient way to do it. <laughs> not, not so bad. Okay, uh, how, many, how many psychiatrists does it take to screw in a light bulb? None, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, my uh, little dinner anecdote is in January of 2009, uh, I had dinner with, uh, I guess you'd call the person a Clinton operative, who said, this was in January, uh, you people are so naive, it's gonna be really ugly. Uh, the p polarization is very severe, you think there's not a red state or a blue, and a blue state in the United States, there's this in the United States. That's the most ridiculous thing ever. Healthcare is gonna have no Republican support. You're gonna go for financial re regulation, go in for a wild ride. You're gonna be opposed and challenged at every turn. It's going to be horrible. I thought that guy is so 1990s, the music he must be listening to is, it's just gone that this is the most naive, old-fashioned person. I had to take a long shower. It was so dirty, what he said. But he was completely right. And of course the reason is that the electoral incentives for either Democrats or Republicans uh, fit with partyism. Behind closed doors often are both confirmation issues and shutdown issues. Republicans and Democrats are far less partyist than they are in their actual behavior. They will say things like Senator Roberts said to me, I think you're going to be fine, but of course I'm going to oppose you. Uh, and that's how, they, uh, uh, that's how they act. They act in accordance with their electoral incentives. Okay, here's James Madison, who was uh, speaking of faction, not partyism, but it's a similar analysis, actually. And I'm going to both celebrate Madison and also discuss what he missed. Liberty is to faction, Madison said, what air is to fire, an element without which it instantly expires. But it could not be less folly to abolish liberty, which is essential to political life because it nourishes faction, than it would be to wish the annihilation of air. Say the same thing about partyism. The second expedient Madison is describing, which is to uh, squelch different opinions, is as impractical. As long as the connection subsists between his reason and his self-love, his opinions and his passions will have a reciprocal influence on one another. Think now about biased assimilation and failing corrections. That goes right out of Madison's theory about the interaction between opinions and passions. And the former will be objects to which the latter will attach themselves. Okay, so Madison says, and this is arguably a point about partyism too, the causes can't be removed, and the relief is only to be sought in the means of controlling its effects. And so Madison urged that a large republic has big advantage over a small one along exactly that dimension. It creates a greater likelihood of virtuous sentiments, 
a reduction of local prejudices and it creates greater security because of the diversity of parties. Okay, this is a very great political theory, probably America's greatest contribution to political theory ever. But there's something that in modern circumstances, at least probably even a century more ago, Madison missed, and I want to try to capture it with something less eloquent, which is an excerpt from a regulation involving particulate matter. Our analysis suggests, now don't cheer up please as I read this, that this rule would yield co-benefits of 37 to 90 billion dollars. The estimate reflects the economic value of a range of avoided health comes, outcomes, including from particulate matter, 4,000 to 11,000 premature deaths. There are also substantial health improvements for kids from reduction, reductions in respiratory illnesses. And the monetized co-benefits co estimate the effect from reduction in carbon emissions resulting from the rule. And I hope it's clear what I'm emphasizing Madison missed. Uh, the technical, empirical, fact-driven nature of sensible policy making. Madison's slide, I think, seems in a way an anachronistic, so 18th century, if we compare it with this slide, where for the legal culture of the political system, the question how to handle mercury in particular matter can't possibly be resolved by thinking, what's your party affiliation, or even what are your defining values? Do you think environmentalists are wonderful or do you think they're horrible? That's hopelessly uninformative on the question whether to go forward with a rule that has numbers like this. And that's basically the heart of my plea for greater discretion on the part of the executive branch, which writes and thinks hard about text like this at least enough of the time to make it a worthwhile endeavor. So first of the closing words is we have an executive order uh, charmingly named 13563, which points to focusing on the human consequences. It look, sees in this light partyism as a heuristic. That's what it is, after all, like racism and sexism, and also a cognitive bias. It's a bias. Here's the hypothesis and the creed of fighting faith. So many American debates, including ones we're having this week, that seems to be seem to be about values are really about facts. That's true about debates over minimum wage, over mercury, over climate change, over how to handle Ebola. That faith, that fighting faith, is the best foundation for combating the scourge of partyism. I'm the symposium editor of the Legal Forum. Today's conference, Does Election Law Serve the Electorate, has produced already some very interesting conversation topics. And thank you so much, Professor Sunstein, for continuing to give us wonderful kernels to think about. Uh, on behalf of the Legal Forum, Viviana Aldous, the executive, the editor in chief, and myself, thank you. That was great. Um, do you have some time for some questions? I do. Please. Wonderful. Please. So I'd like to open it up to the floor. I see Professor Charles. Thank you so much for, for this. Very interesting. So you describe a sense of tribalism uh, manifested itself through partyism um, and group and outgroup bias through the medium of party. Um, so one quick question for you along those domains. To what extent what you're calling now partyism is really the effect of a migration of different types of isms that are really no longer as relevant as they were before, right? So um, end group and out group favoritism on the basis of race and gender and other things, whereas party is much more, um, it's much more possible and acceptable and legitimate. Um, and if that's true, I wonder if it calls into question the faith that you have into technical change, right? Climate science might be a very good example here where it seems to be that talking about the facts and talking about um, the technicalities of it does not, does not appear to have an impact on how people are thinking about it. So the, tech, the technicality and facts are themselves um, 
filtered through the lens of parties precisely because of the biases and the epistemic considerations that you yourself bring to bear. So it seems that the, the principle of faith um, is itself a um, filter through the lens of partyism. Excellent. Uh, uh, Professor Posner here has uh, a very interesting <coughs> paper, and a good paper, like all his papers are. Uh, and it, it is critical of the U.S. government's effort to come up with the social cost of carbon. I've referred to the social cost of carbon. It's in that slide that didn't make your picture up. Uh, and what he said is, instead of having this process that is based on technical assumptions that he thought uh, not clearly right, uh, Congress or the President should come up with a social cost of carbon. And my answer to your question is why I think Professor Posner on this count uncharacteristically was wrong. And that is, if you ask Congress to come up with a social cost of carga, carbon, is the word OMG or LOL? <laughs> What's that going to look like, that exercise? Are they going to do anything? They're coming up with a number? We're going to get votes for a number? Um, if you ask the president to do it personally, probably either a Republican or Democratic president would think, technical people, what do you think? He's not going to say, I think the social cost of carbon is X. Technical <coughs> people run the machinery. So the idea is, in this area, which is in some ways the least promising for the technical foundation, both because it's so politically inflected, and because the science, at least on generating the number, has a wide variety of views in it. Still, that's one where you want the technical people involved, and you want the delegation. Here's another way to put it. When I was, uh, when Congress, a number of years ago, was thinking about regulatory reform, I testified and said, uh, you know, you should think about Congress coming up with a value for statistical life. That's a pivotal number. It should be arrived at democratically. Sure, you like cost-benefit analysis, but what's the valuation? Should you either come up with one or, uh, or give guidance for it? And they looked at me like I had completely lost my mind. And I think I hadn't lost my mind, but I was entirely wrong. And the reason is Congress coming up with a value of statistical life? It's a really technical question. If you ask the U.S. government what the value of statistical life is, it's $9 million, roughly. If you ask whether that's a politicized judgment, the answer is the furthest thing from it. It's driven by economic analyses, where there's a meta-analysis written by uh, Vanderbilt's Vescuzzi and Kennedy School's Aldi. And the meta-analysis comes up with the number that the agencies are using. And so values to life is more confusing than politically reflected. Though easy to make it so. Climate change is that. I agree with you that on, on the climate change issue, the information out there doesn't bring people in line. But the, but the government needs to do something, or not, depending on what the science justifies. And the institution <coughs> we have that's best at doing the technical thing is the executive branch. I'll tell you another little story. I'll tell you maybe too many stories, no more substance. But sometimes the stories have substance in them. Uh, a friend of mine in the government said after three months in the Obama administration, he said, gosh, I'm starting to think that three quarters of the things I like least about the Bush administration aren't true. Meaning he saw what the people had done under the Bush administration close up, and by and large, not always of course, there were things that were really technical judgments that were turned through the political filter into something awful. But once you saw them close up, they were technical judgments. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to challenge the, the claim that, that you're, you're fighting faith, right? That, that, that really we're disagreeing about facts, not about values. I wonder if this is an artifact of a tendency I think one sometimes sees among utilitarians to think that utilitarianism is value neutral as opposed to being a value. Um, right? Because, it, it, you know, so you said it was highly technocratic to come up with this $9 million valuation on like, um, but there are plenty of philosophical systems that would say uh, it's not technocratic at all. It's, it's, it's a value choice that you can put a dollar amount on human life. And it may be one that we are used to as lawyers, uh, especially uh, uh, you know, late 20th century lawyers. Uh, um, but it, it's, it's not uncontroversial, and it's not value-free. Right? It's value-made. Um, and I, I wonder if 
a lot of the heuristics you point to where things that seem like they shouldn't influence our, our judgments of facts uh, uh, seem like they influence people's judgments of facts are, are actually best described as people have a certain value judgment uh, and then they're going to sort of make the facts fit their value. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the, the disagreement actually reduces to one about facts. It's a disagreement about values that's then causing people to misperceive the facts. And if that's the case, uh, doesn't it suggest that, that, you know, that, that a technocratic solution to a value-based problem uh, is, is ill fitting? That's excellent. And there's a lot there, and at the level of abstraction in which you spoke, I, I think you're right. Um, the question whether there are concrete issues where immersion in the facts can lead people, whatever their political convictions, whatever their philosophical, philosophical judgments, in, to, in the same direction. Now, if you believe that there's no value that can be put on a human life, and it's not clear what that means concretely, but let's say that's what you believe, then the nine million number will seem preposterous and offensive. But then the question the advocate of the number, number will say, then what are you going to do about a visibility rule that costs $700 million and is going to save 50 lives? Where there's an alternative approach that would cost $900 million and save 80 lives, and there's an alternative approach that could cost $200 and could save 30 lives. Which are you choose? Now the person has to give a choice, and that's going to involve an implicit assignment. Now, it may be that this is kind of block-headed on my part. I'm so in the grip of the values to this like framework that I see it as unavoidable. But bracket that. The, the, the claim here is not that we don't have value disagreements. But take the minimum wage as an example. If it turned out, as some people think, that the minimum wage doesn't have a great effect on poor people, really, because the beneficial effect, because most of the people who would be benefited are not themselves poor and that the principal effect of the minimum wage would be to increase unemployment, and the numbers look like this, and then you specify them, and then you say people who are going to be unemployed are people who really need jobs desperately because they're at the bottom of the economic ladder. Now those are factual claims. If they're true, who wants the minimum wage? It is very hard to come up with a judgment of value such that one would want the minimum wage on those assumptions. Or, if you take the view that some economists hold, that the minimum wage would have no effect on unemployment, and take a number of people who are below or close to the poverty line and give them a real shot at having a decent life, then who's against the minimum wage? Oh, a lot of libertarians are. Well, the libertarians could be, and then the question, what would be the theory of value that on that statement of consequences annuls the minimum wage? You know, if, if you are a car-carrying libertarian of a certain sort, where the minimum wage is unacceptable, even on the most rosy view of its consequences, then there's nothing that can be said, and there is that kind of disagreement. But notice the political debate over the minimum wage is fundamentally a debate along the dimensions I'm describing. The Democrats are giving the optimistic view of its likely effects, and the Republicans are challenging them. My view is that the, the, everything depends on who's right on the facts. The, the libertarian view, maybe this is just wrong, but on one view, the libertarian view that opposes the minimum wage, even on very rosy assumptions of the facts, it's very hard to figure out what are the foundations of that view we could describe them. So, so you're right, but my claim is that along, for many issues, the value disagreement is actually um, in a way, a sideshow, and what's really driving people is implicit assumptions about facts. If that's not true, and on some questions it's not true, maybe it's not true on guns, then value judgments are the ones that are the drivers, and if partyism and value conflict are aligned, then there we are. Uh, the word off of this is there. I'm kind of cautious. It didn't even say usually. It just said often. <coughs> So if I remember Hofstadter correctly, he describes how in the 1830s we got the notion of a party system that had embedded with it the idea of the loyal opposition. Prior to that, after the emergence of parties in America, the idea was to squelch the other party if they were treacherous to the founding and needed to be eliminated. But that once a party system developed, each party accepted the legitimacy of the other party within the system. So I guess one question that I have is, is, is what you describe as a pathology of partisanship 
Is that something that ebbs and flows in the course of American history? Does it accelerate um, for some reason? I mean, it, it, uh, you know, why are we at a particularly worse period if we are, you know, relative to other spans of, of history? And so that's the problem. And then if you, if you didn't have the constraint of the Constitution and Madisonian separation of power, would the solution just be to eliminate Congress and have only, a, you know, an elected president, so we sort of elected dictator, as it were, as, as, as the, the optimal solution to the pathology? On the second, I would say no. That, uh, <laughs> that the system of separation of powers is a safeguard of liberty. So if that is what you're describing as nuclear, what I'm describing is, is much more incremental as a, as a step forward. Uh, in terms of arc of history, that's actually an empirical question. And all the data we have is from recent history. And it's suggesting a massive upsurge in arc history. So the early slides were meant to establish partyism, 1975 or so, was a non-problem, was a non-issue. And now it's a big issue. By the way, the measures, comparative measures in the United Kingdom, aren't picking up an increase in partyism. So it seems a distinctly American phenomenon. In terms of its actual causes, uh, I gave some speculations. I don't think we know yet. I'm going to try to keep working on it, and some political scientists have some ideas, but we just don't know the answer to that. Borders with the political science of the 1950s always talk about the unmoved mover of party identification be defining all that is party identification streets and ethnic identity that predated all the Mugnians. So it's a suggestion that in the past we've had as much partyism that look at the politics of the 40s and 30s. My question is about delegation. Um, uh, one thing we've seen in the, in the periods of political polarization is that the executive has, in fact, seemed to engage in much more direct policy making. Um, and this is a function of the fact that getting things through Congress is hard and everything else. And so the question is, so haven't we already seen the increased delegation that you're calling for? And do we need a different standard when the incentives of politicians who can achieve through legislation already have this incentive to do more things through the technocratic means of the executive action? And Okay, so you might think that just empirically it is the case that the executive branch does more on its own in the face of blockage. But there are two questions, I guess. One is, how well will you assess that? We might think that that's, as many Democrats did under President Bush, that that's a, uh, either a literal constitutional violation or structurally <coughs> objectionable. Or we might think that given the situation as discussed, that, that should be welcomed. So there's a general sense of the attitude. Then there's a question for the legal system, which is how receptive ought it to be? And the technical doctrine is the Chevron doctrine. And the claim is that uh, Chevron's uh, uh, deepest foundation, sympathetically understood, are going to grant the president not a trampled discretion by any means, but a, a margin of adjustment authority that might not have such an urgent uh, foundation as it does in the era of partyism. So there are legal adjustments to be had. Uh, a number of people think that uh, President Obama's interpretation of the authorization for the use of military force was, was not right. And part of one's judgment, I think, about whether his interpretation was right is right on the question we're describing. If we have, as University of Chicago's former uh, star international law person Jack Goldsmith thinks, you know, a strong presumption in favor of congressional authorization, in particular for everything. Then one set of legal outcomes, which should be influencing Congress and the executive branch, follows. This obviously bears on the immigration issues which are being discussed now. Now, if it's a flat violation of the law, we're in a different domain. But th there's play in the joints here. <coughs> We could say a lot more about this, but it would, the idea is that to see delegation as a thing we should welcome ex ante and be not uh, skeptical of action pursuant to ex post, uh, that could be a product of one view of partyism 2014. Um, so the premise of your talk is that the executive branch is uh, much less susceptible to the ills of partyism than the legislature at large. 
Uh, and that seems right as a description of our current political moment. Uh, but I wanted to probe you know, whether it really holds on both ends uh, if you broaden the, the lens a little bit. Uh, so you, you mentioned already the George W. Bush. <coughs> um, there were lots of stories at the time, including from former insiders in the administration, that uh, politics was all anybody cared about when the administration was making uh, you know, bureaucratic decisions. Uh, and they, they wanted to hear the political consequences and ignored a lot of the, you know, the facts or the more technocratic aspects. Uh, so I wonder, you know, is it just this administration or is it really administrations generally that are uh, less susceptible to partyism? On the congressional side, you know, it seems right that congressional leaders in public uh, are very partyist. Um, you know, you mentioned that uh, in private they're not as partyist. Uh, and I would expect the congressional staffers, you know, the CBO and other organs of Congress, you know, those also wouldn't be uh, extremely partyist. Um, so I guess in a way, you know, it's a fair question really, if Congress had a spontaneous debate on the value of human <coughs> life, would that be a good conversation? You know, or is the relevant question more, you know, if Congress uh, had its staffers get to work, if they consulted with the CBO, you know, then could they come up with a more technocratic, less partyist approach you know, to that issue or any other? <coughs> Both are really good questions. You, you could certainly imagine uh, an institutional judgment which wouldn't be on its face inconsistent with the evidence, suggesting that the executive branch is only at certain times uh, a technocratic entity and that Congress could adjust itself to be more technically uh, uh, informed and operate pursuant to that. I, I think we don't have a lot of times when Congress is is generally invested in details. And one reason is that they are by nature generalists, and this is true of their staffers also. So members of Congress, I worked closely with them when I was there, and I thought Jeff and I had some dealings with them when we were on the President's Review Board. We were very upbeat about the members of Congress who have They're great, but they're generalists. Even the ones who are committee heads are unlikely to know as much about the details as, for example, uh, Professor Stone did after four months of intense engagement with the details. Because that's basically what he did. And even a congressional committee head, they're not going to be mastering details. And the staffers, too, the staffers are, some of you probably have been or will be staffers. They're from the University of Chicago. That might be unbelievable. But the likelihood that they would have that kind of technical mastery some of the executive branch has, it's not high unless they are real specialists. And we don't see that all the time in Congress. On the executive branch side, you, know, you might be right. And uh, it's an empirical question, uh, don't know. My impression of the Bush administration, having now worked with a number of people who worked in the Bush administration, is that the notion of politicization in the Bush administration as a universal driver is a bum rap that maybe on some issues there was a lot of political uh, uh, attention. And certainly the press loves to say that things were done on political grounds. But the disjunction between the press's account of why decisions are made of the government and the actuality is so gaping that I find it very hard to believe those accounts. If there's a, a, a former Bush administration official, that, of course, has uh, credibility. But it might be that they're talking about isolated questions on the day-to-day -day stuff, which governance is, which often doesn't make it in the front page. Uh, what I understand is the Bush administration, you know, they were running a lot of numbers. I'm sorry to have to cut the conversation short, but don't want an angry note from your daughter. No. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Professor. Yeah.